Hi there, I'm Ryan Alice, and I'm doing a video project on all I've learned by the age of 28. Now, I'm going to talk about leadership. At the end of the day, your abilities as a leader, along with your abilities as a communicator, end up directly impacting your ability to make change in the world and inspire others to achieve great things with you. So here are 25 leadership lessons I've learned over the last 10 years. The first one, and I'd say one of the most important, is to make sure you're passionate about what you are leading your team toward accomplishing. If getting up that hill is something you're not passionate about, it is going to be very hard to get up that hill. If you're not passionate about achieving the goal, you're leading the wrong organization. And even if you're a CEO for hire, or even if it's the company that you built, if you are not passionate or no longer passionate about the change you're working to make in the world, you need to stop what you're doing and find yourself an organization whose mission and purpose is aligned with your personal mission and purpose to make change in the world. The second step is to surround yourself with people smarter than yourself, people of high integrity and people passionate about achieving the same goal as you. Now, it's possible to inculcate passion, to take someone who is a highly competent, smart person and share with them through stories and through your understanding of the world about why you're passionate about what you're passionate about and to create that passion in someone else. But it is so much easier if you seek out and identify in advance people who are highly competent who also are passionate about the same thing as you, about making the world a better place in however way you wish to make the world a better place. And if you can do that and build a team of people who are passionate and highly competent and smart, you often can achieve things that you cannot even believe. The third lesson is to only hire someone as a direct report if he or she can do their job at least twice as well than you could. If you're hiring someone to take over as your chief operating officer, make sure they can run the ops of your company at least twice as well as you can. Same thing with marketing, with finance, with product management, with customer service, with sales, any position. That person you hire needs to do it at least twice as well as you can. The fourth lesson, and one that I think is a little controversial in managerial science, is to never have more than five direct reports. If you have a board of directors to manage as well, make it four. Now for me, what I found is that once I got to about 25 employees at eye contact, it would have been very helpful to have a chief operating officer that managed the operations of the company on a day-to-day -day basis and assured our achievement of our goals and our metrics. Well, I could focus on strategy, product development, understanding the market, building culture, and raising capital, the things that I really enjoy doing. And so I ended up at one point having eight direct reports at eye contact, plus a five-person board of directors on top of that. And what I found is that I wasn't able to do either of my main roles as CEO well, building the company and building the culture and developing the product or running the day-to-day -day operations. And so what I find for a good structure, for me at least, is to have someone that runs finance, someone that runs people and HR, someone that runs operations, have a great, amazing executive assistant, someone that runs product, and then the rest underneath the chief operating officer. Fifth lesson, make sure you and your team are completely clear on what you're trying to achieve by when, what the definition of success is numerically, and why what you're trying to achieve matters in the world. I find too often team misalignment is the biggest challenge to goal achievement. And oftentimes, the reason why the team is misaligned is because they're working toward different goals. Often because they don't understand numerically what the goal is in the first place. And regardless of where in the organization a person works, he or she should be able to point to a printed out piece of paper that has a small number of clearly defined numerical goals for the entire company and for their entire department. And their departmental goals, numerical as well, should align with what's necessary for the department to do its job in achieving the company goals. Now personally, I like to do those department and company goals on a quarterly basis. In I contact, we would hold a quarterly kickoff meeting where we rolled out our five key goals for each three month period. Now ideally you would do that just before the start of the next quarter or on the first day, the very first business day of that quarter. Oftentimes in planning cycles, companies end up launching annual plans in February on a 
and a, with a calendar that starts January 1st. And I often find that if you lose that first month, you end up being off track from the beginning. So numerically define what you want to achieve and have your goals align across the different departments so that you can avoid silos of communication and you can avoid misalignment in an organization. The sixth lesson I found is to paint a clear vision with your words and with imagery and communicate it succinctly, visually, broadly, and repeatedly. You have to know where you're going and then lead people there. I've seen some leaders in my experience who ultimately ended up being ineffective leaders because they simply wanted to guide other people in the direction that other people wanted to go. And at the end of the day, a strong leader is someone who knows where he or she is going, knows why they're going there, and can motivate and inspire and guide others toward that path, regardless of the challenges ahead. The seventh lesson is that your job as a leader, as a CEO, is to find numerical, objective, unemotional, red, yellow, and green, black and white success for each of your direct reports. And that their job is to define, each of, define numerical success for each of their direct reports, and so on. At the end of the day, you have to have clear goals that are easily measured on a quarterly, monthly, weekly basis and be able to track progress against predefined goals that you're going after. The eighth lesson that I've learned about leadership, and it's one of the most powerful, is that if you take the time to get to know your employees well and understand them personally, not necessarily all of your employees because that might be impossible, but at least, at the very least, the ones that report to you, and understand what each of your direct reports life goals are. For them, what are the next five years of their life truly about? Is it raising a family? Is it saving for college? Is it about achieving an innovation where they could perhaps be listed on a patent? Figure out what motivates them and what drives them beyond just simply financial returns. And if you can integrate the success for the individual toward his or her own life goals with success for your numerical goals for your project and for your company and for your division, you can achieve tremendous results because you'll have unlocked the most powerful force in human nature and that's intrinsic desire. Step nine or lesson nine is to define success quantitatively, which I've spoken about a lot, and then track it on a really big monitor. You want to be able to show visually and unemotionally your progress against predefined goals and you want to be able to show it in a place that is transparent to everyone in your company. Lesson 10 describes a two-way commitment between yourself and your direct reports. And the, the conversation with each of your team members at the beginning of their time with your company should go like this. It should, you should be describing that and explaining that in exchange for that employee a, being a leader and realizing that the job of a leader is to ensure that the person who follows them in their role is better than they were and that each team member that reports to you agrees that before they ever leave whether it's retirement or quitting or taking a new job that they will train identify hire and train the replacement that you in return in exchange will never surprise them with termination that you'll provide them with severance that you will give them notice in advance of when you're even considering letting them go and so I think it's a two-way street you provide people with a long-term commitment to them and never surprising them and in exchange they agree that they will identify and train their replacement before they leave I find that one of the biggest challenges to companies achieving aggressive goals in the middle to later stages is critical executives leading, leaving during really important times. And by inculcating the value from the very beginning that a true leader finds, identifies, finds, and trains the replacement before they leave, you will ensure continuity within your organization. Lesson 11 is to never let something important go unsaid. Now, it's important to choose words carefully and not necessarily say everything, but it is important to say everything important. And not only for you, but all of your team members. Too often I find that employees are afraid of their bosses, afraid of their managers, the very people who are supposed to be leading them and guiding them towards success. 
And if an employee is afraid of the person leading them or the person leading the person leading them, they will leave out critically important feedback. The best organizations are not ones where the brains are just at the top. The best organizations are one where the knowledge and power and ability is distributed across the whole company. And the best organizations have systems that drive that important feedback about products, about product development, about market research and customer feedback all the way from all of the parts of the organization that interact directly with customers all the way up to the top of the organization which too frequently doesn't have too much interaction with the end user. Lesson 12 is to listen and actively seek out information from your team. You've built a great team and are probably paying a lot of money for your team and you're probably holding meetings with your management team quite frequently and you have lots of meetings and discussions with them but oftentimes they won't tell you something difficult to hear unless you ask them and so you need to be actively seeking out information from your team and while you might hope that they'll tell you important information without you having to ask for it it is important to ask for the difficult information particularly the information that might include data that doesn't necessarily support the conclusion about the strategy that you might be about to spend millions of dollars pursuing you want to encourage heretics and people who will think differently than you lesson 13 is to always take the time particularly with your direct reports to explain the mental math and the factors leading into your decisions People will follow a good leader, but people will follow a good leader even further if that good leader takes the time to explain the reasoning behind why they are deciding what they are deciding. You could go up to a very talented graphic designer and piss them off royally by asking them to change the background. But if you ask them to change the background and simply explain why you feel like the background should be changed, they will learn and understand and better be able to predict what you want in the future. So take time to share your rationale and your reasoning behind your decisions, particularly with those you are giving direct instruction to. Lesson 14 is that you want to seek out and ask unpopular opinions from your team. And this is similar to a lesson a couple lessons ago in terms of actively seeking information. Here you want to actively seek information good or bad and look for unpopular opinions. Fifteen is that if you want to achieve a difficult goal, one of the ways to do that is to create an incentive prize with clear guidelines and publicize it internally and if you wish externally. This is why hackathons and X prizes work so well. Time to find periods in which there is a prize at the end for achieving something significant. I talked earlier in the presentation about the $10 million Ansari X Prize in 2004 in which the Spaceship One team reached space twice in a private spaceship within two weeks and won that prize that was seven years in the, in the making. Now that prize was built after the Ortega Prize which was won by Charles Lindb Lindbergh in 1927 for being the first to fly nonstop from New York to Paris. Prizes have amazing focus on human ingenuity and it's amazing what can be accomplished if you get a good team together and give them a certain prize for achieving a result. Why? Because one of the 12 human desires is to impress others and also to leave a legacy. And so if you can create a situation which you can enable your team to create something and get credit for achieving something very difficult, either from an engineering standpoint or a result standpoint, definitely do it. Another example with a prize that turned into an amazing result outside of a company was when Netflix a few years back offered a one million dollar prize to any team that could create an algorithm that was at least 10% better at matching preferences of movies with the actual movies that were recommended in their recommendation engine. A team ended up winning that full prize and they had a much better recommendation engine. Lesson 16 is that every member of your team should have a significant portion of their pay tied to company success. Now, in order for that to be fair, it has to be predefined and it has to be quantitative and easily measurable. And ideally, you'd have a chart or a TV, a monitor, in which you could show that on in real time as your company progresses. The corollary to that is that every member of your team should have equity ownership. You want to share your success and make sure your employees share in the growth of your company. And as your company is able, you'll provide additional benefits like health care, dental coverage, doc options, the 401k plan. And as your employee skills grow and their contribution grows, you want to reward them with better than market compensation. 
Getting, getting great talent to be committed to you is one of the most important parts of being a leader and building a great company. And providing the ability for an uh, employee, for a team member to vest ownership in your company and have the right to purchase stock over time is critically important. On this next page is a chart of a rule of thumb for different amounts of equity or stock options that can be provided to your team based on your stage of funding and how late you're, you are in your company's evolution, depending on the role. And so if you're bringing on a chief operating officer after you've raised a few hundred thousand dollars in our post seed, that person might expect 10 to 20 percent. If you're bringing on an engineer, four years into the business, that person might get one-tenth of one percent, which in many cases could still turn into hundreds of thousands of dollars if you exit for more than a million, for more than a hundred million dollars. And so while this is just a few uh, simple rules of thumb, it basically, the whole principle is that as time continues, there's more capital in a company and there's more customer progress and more value creation. And as more value is created, less equity is provided because there's less risk. And so the earlier you get into a private company, the more stock and the more stock ownership and options you can receive. And so depending on your stage of funding, how much dilution, how much capital you raised and the stage of your product, use a chart like this to determine how much to provide to your employees. But certainly make sure every full-time employee, if not every part-time employee as well, receives some ownership or right to purchase ownership in your company. Lesson 18 is to have a vision, which almost all leaders do, and to communicate it, which the best leaders do. Make sure you clearly communicate your vision for the company, as no one follows a leader who cannot communicate the way in which the company will succeed. At the end of the day, many people need to feel secure. And they need to feel like the person or the team in charge has a plan that is well thought through towards success particularly individuals who start joining your company as it gets to a later stage and are not as entrepreneurial as the original team. Now the future of your employees in terms of their career and their family's security is directly tied to the success of your company, which certainly motivates them to contribute. But they want, you want to make sure that your team believes in your company, what it stands for, its mission, its purpose, and believes in your products and services. And make sure that they know that the hard work that they are putting in now will likely pay off. So you have to not only have a vision, but communicate it effectively as well to align your team toward a common purpose and a common goal. Lesson 19 is one of the most important, and it's the golden rule applied to business. And that's to treat people with respect at all times. Whether they be employees, customers, suppliers, partners, regardless, treat all people within your life and within your business operations with respect at all times. Lesson 20 is to have fun. Don't be too serious. Make the business environment enjoyable. We spend too much time at work for it to be boring. Nothing can beat the effects of a company uh, outing or celebrating after reaching an important milestone. So celebrate, encourage practical jokes, encourage laughing. Now, you wanna have your own maker time where people, where the engineers and developers can focus and be in flow, but you also wanna have time to celebrate and come together, build community, and have fun. And finding that right balance is the goal of a good leader. Number 21 is to work hard yourself and alongside your team. Make sure the employees, your team sees you there and working with them as no one likes to work hard for someone who doesn't work him hard himself or herself, especially early on. Do your best to be the first to arrive and the last to leave whenever possible. You as the leader likely have tremendously more economic incentives to make your team, to make your company succeed. So at the very least, make sure you're there and committed as much as your team is, if not more. Role 22, or lesson 22, is to make sure everyone knows that you are available to be reached, that they can talk to you anytime. So keep your door open, or at least have time when anyone can come chat with you that is scheduled. Regardless of whether your own office, your own office exists yet, make sure people know you're accessible and that you're approachable anytime about any problem that they're having. 
One of the reasons that information gets trapped in silos in an organization is because customer feedback from the front lines is not getting to the people who make the budgetary resource allocations that can invest in making the product better. And if you don't get the right information to be able to make the right investment decisions to make the product better, whether it be in the product management process or the investment and financial uh, management process, you can't create a great product that continually enthralls your user base. Lesson number 23 is to build caring relationships with your direct reports. Now you want to have a professional relationship, but you also want to understand what they've been through personally, to share life stories, to take time to go out to dinner with each one of your direct reports at least every couple months. Without understanding at least the very basics of what's incurring in your direct reports out of office life, it can be hard to truly connect with that person, even on a professional level. One thing I've tried to do is to get is to take that person and their significant other out to dinner the first night of their employment. And it serves as a way to both celebrate the occasion as well as learn a little bit about that person and their family that might not come out in interviews or through reading a resume. Lesson number 24 is to commend and praise more than you criticize. Too many leaders are quiet when an employee is doing well and the second an employee does something wrong, they are all over them. You have to be in, you have to have a com commendation to criticizing ratio greater than three to one. You have to make it make seem make it, you have to make it seem that you not only condemn and you're not only there to correct. You have to encourage and praise publicly and create award systems and peer recognition systems. Many people thrive on peer and superior recognition just as much as on money. And so instituting a program and a process through which you can be in, through which you can ensure that you commend people publicly will enable you to motivate people and encourage their own intrinsic motivations to come to the forefront. And finally, the 25th lesson I've learned about leadership is to consciously build an amazing culture. At Eye Contact, for the nine years we were building the company, we truly worked to build a family culture. When someone was moving into a new house or needed a ride home, we did our best to create a culture where we were there to help, particularly in the early years. We worked in about building people up and we created five values that we called Wow Me, which stood for wow the customer, operate with urgency, work without mediocrity, make a positive wake, and engage as an owner. And now even six months after I left eye contact after the acquisition by Vocus, I still remember what that acronym means off the top of my head. And it's very important to create a set of values that everyone in your company remembers and to take time to celebrate your victories together. Those are the lessons I've learned about leadership and hope to learn many more in the years ahead. Thanks for watching.